Hello, thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and I recently finished watching the Dune miniseries, both Dune from 2000 as well as Children of Dune from 2003. And today I'm just going to share my opinions on them as well as some changes between the miniseries and the books. And Dune is an adaptation of the book Dune and then Children of Dune is an adaptation of both Dune Messiah as well as Children of Dune, the third book in the series. And this video is probably going to be <laughs> kind of all over the place. It's not not like the most structured and I'm not going to go through every detail you know like the videos I did for Dune part one and part two are much more thorough. This is going to be more like my David Lynch Dune review where I'm just kind of sharing my random thoughts you know. And I'm going to begin talking about Dune and I'm just going to dive right into spoilers. At this point so many people have seen Dune part two but if you have not seen Dune part two, if you have not read the book, if you do not want to know what happens then honestly you just shouldn't watch any of this video because I'm just gonna get right into it. If you do not want spoilers for Dune Messiah or Children of Dune, that's okay. You can still watch this first part. But once I get into Children of Dune, that is where you should leave. And before getting into my Dune thoughts, I do want to thank the Instagram account AI Generated Pick by AI because I had started, so this is a four and a half hour show divided into three parts. And I had started part one, I made it like 20 minutes into it, but then I paused it and I was like, I'm gonna return to this later when I have more time. However, <laughs> When I returned just a few days later, part one had been removed from YouTube. And so I had posted on my Instagram story being like, does anyone know where I can watch part one without having to buy the DVD? Because one, the DVD was kind of expensive and two, it was shipping all the way from Australia. So I didn't want to have to wait for it to arrive. So yeah, so I posted on Instagram asking people if they knew where I could watch part one and they sent me a link where I could watch it. So without them, I would not have been able to watch part one. So thank you so much for sending that to me. It was so helpful. It was also much better quality than the YouTube version, but I did watch Children of Dune on YouTube. However, at this point that also has been removed off of YouTube. So yeah, anyway, I wanted to give them a shout out and thank them for sending that to me. But to get into Dune the miniseries. So this is a very faithful adaptation for the most part. There are some changes we will get into, but I would say out of the the three Dune versions I have seen. This one follows the plot the closest and that is what I had heard about this show so that is also what I expected. And a lot of the dialogue does come straight from the books. So even though I don't need an adaptation to include every detail and in fact I don't want, I for the most part I don't want an adaptation to include every detail. I don't think that's necessary and I also don't think it makes for a good movie or show oftentimes. But I do like when they take dialogue straight from the page. I just think that's so cool. And we do get a lot of that here in Dune. But of course there are still some changes which I want to get into beginning with Princess Irulan. So in the book we get her historical segments at the start of each chapter but we, we don't actually get any scenes with her though until the very end. Whereas the TV show we have her throughout the show. She shows up much more often. She is even at the banquet that the Atreides host once they take over Arrakis. And speaking of the banquet, so I do really like this scene in the book. And in the book Paul like holds his own at the table as he is talking with these adults. Whereas here, like he kind of gets upset and storms off partway through. And then later he's like drinking the spice beer. And then Paul is mimicking the Baron and like as a way to entertain Gurney Halleck who he is hanging out with. But then Princess Irulan shows up and so unknowingly she sees him imitating the Baron just being silly. And then later they have a moment where she's like, you're so much more complicated and complex than I gave you credit for. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of a funny line considering like she's saw him like being silly on spice beer and now she's like wow you're so much more complex. <laughs> uh, but they do also bond about the fact that they don't have control over their lives because uh, their powerful parents are the ones calling the shots and so yeah they have this moment where they kind of bond and connect and this is not in the book at all. And then another big change is that Princess Irulan is the one who wants Fade Rotha seduced and in the in the book the Bene Gesserit want Margot Fenring to seduce Fade Rotha in order to secure the bloodline because that is a huge part of the Bene Gesserit is they are strategically having sex with certain people in order to have certain children and combine different bloodlines and they want to create the Kwisak Cataract and all of that. And that is not 
in the show like that is not a focus at all and i thought that was a really compelling interesting part of the book and we see that in the new movies as well but yeah this show doesn't really delve into that and yeah irulan's reason for wanting to seduce fade ratha is because she has heard what has happened on arrakis with the atreides and so she's just wanting to get more information because she feels like her dad isn't telling her dad is the emperor and she feels like he's not telling her the full story and so she seduced his fade in order to get information and then another scene that i was surprised was left out is after you know yui betrays the atreides and everything paul and jessica are taken hostage and in the book and in the new movies we see them you know in the harkonnen uh, ornithopter and then they use the voice to kill the harkonnens whereas here we just see jessica tied up and held captive and the next thing we know she and paul are both just in the desert so they totally got rid of that scene where they use the voice to kill the harkonnens and then we also don't get the scene in the tent which follows this and in the book this scene in the tent is when paul reveals that lady jessica's father is the baron harkonnen and in the book she had not known this yet however when paul tells this to her her, she can feel that it's true whereas in the show they have him realize this after he has drank the water of life but what doesn't make sense is that when he confronts jessica and tells her that her father is the baron at this point she's the reverend mother she has drank the water of life and yet when he tells this to her she's acting like she had no idea and so either she's pretending <laughs> that she hadn't known or like there, it doesn't make sense that she wouldn't know because she drank the water of life so she would know just as much as paul <laughs> but i guess that's showing how you know because he's a male and when he drank the water of life he was able to see where she couldn't kind of a thing so I guess that's what it's implying but still I feel like that's a plot hole like she should have known since she also had drank the water of life like she would have seen who her father was and then another change is that we do just see more of Chani which again I think is a good call because in the books I mean you get a feel for Chani and I did like her in the books but in the show we just see more of her and we see the bond between her and Paul we also see more of their son Leto which again was a good call because in the books you just hear about Leto you never actually see him meaning Leto their son and so when he dies like it's sad because it's always sad if, if a baby dies but it wasn't sad in that we were connected to him because we weren't because we got no scenes with him and so I like that the show gave us more scenes with their child Leto who ends up dying in both show and book and then also in this version I would say Chani you know in the book she was supportive of Paul but I would say here she is like even more <laughs> supportive of him and she's just like you know what? I'll do whatever he needs me to do like I'm on his side I'm on his team whatever he needs is okay by me. And so of course I'm, you know, skipping right to the end, but when he is going to marry Princess Irulan, she's on board with it. <laughs> and she, I'm sure she has some issues, but for the most part, she is totally fine. And this is something that comes up more in the miniseries, both Dune and Children of Dune, is this idea that when you're in these powerful positions, marriage is not about love, <laughs> right? Like nobody marries for love here. It's all about political moves and power. And that is what marriage is about about and everybody just realizes that right and so no one is that offended when a marriage is just about power or politics because they know it right like if you're gonna be in a relationship with someone of such high status like you just know that's the way it is right and so she's not upset to be a concubine really and we also get that final line by lady jessica where she's like history will call the concubines wives because we're the ones that the men truly love and yeah that line is definitely said in more of a romantic way because again Paul and Chani, like they're doing good <laughs> at the end of the show. And then also, as in the book, we do learn that Chani is the daughter of Liet Kynes. And the show also does a good job at showing what a big deal Liet Kynes was amongst the Fremen and how he had this dream of turning Arrakis into a paradise. And even after he dies, the Fremen still are holding strong to this goal and this dream. They're going to make it happen. And yeah, Liet Kynes, like he was a huge deal amongst the Fremen. He worked for the Emperor, but then once he was sent to Arrakis, he got very close with the Fremen and he became such an important figure to them and the new movies do not show this at all with kinds and so yeah I did like that this show we see what a big deal kinds is and this dream he has to like terraform Arrakis you know and so so I did like that they made sure to include that aspect here in the miniseries 
And then, like I said, we do get the time jump, which, which means we do see Aaliyah, and I did love her scenes. We get a lot of scenes with her that come from the book, like when she stops the newborn baby crying, and then also the part where she's talking to Jessica, being like, you know, I'm a freak, people don't like me. However, in this scene in the book, Hera shows up, and Hera had been the wife of Jameis, who Paul killed. And Hera actually does love Aaliyah, and so they have this bond in the book. But Hera is not in any adaptation I have seen. I don't, I don't think she's in the David Lynch one. But yeah, in the book, Jameis had a wife and like two sons. And because Paul killed Jameis, now the wife and sons are his responsibility. But the sons show up in like one scene and then that's it. So they are not important at all. So I'm totally fine with adaptations getting rid of the sons. And even though Hera becomes a bit more important, for the most part, she doesn't do too much either. So it also makes sense that they got rid of her. But yeah, back to Aaliyah. She is the one who ends up killing the Baron as well, like we see in the book. And in general, I thought the actor who played her did a good job and I like her portrayal here better than the David Lynch portrayal of her. And then as far as the Denny Villeneuve movie, I will say that the way they chose to film that with Jessica talking to Aaliyah while she is still pregnant with her, that has really grown on me. I now think that is such a cool and weird way to show Aaliyah being awoken in the womb due to the water of life. And I, I wish we would have had more scenes with Jessica talking to Aaliyah the fetus because yeah, I just think that was such a cool way to demonstrate what was happening. And so even though in my video I was saying how I missed seeing Aaliyah and I wished we would have seen her be born, and while I do love seeing Aaliyah in the book, at the same time I can respect the way they chose to film that in the new movie, and while I wouldn't have minded to have seen Jessica give birth at some point in the show, for the most part I'm on board with what they did and I think it was just really unsettling and weird to see Jessica talking to her unborn baby, you know. But then I want to to talk about Thufir Howitt because he is in part one. However, after the Harkonnens take over, we do not see anything. <laughs> like I assume he was killed, but in the book, he becomes the Mentat for the Baron. You know, they blackmail him into being their Mentat, but he is also laying his own schemes and he thinks Jessica is the traitor and ultimately he ends up committing suicide. But yeah, he is not in this once the Harkonnens take over. And also I feel like they don't really show the point of the Mentats very well in the mini series. And I also don't think, yet again, I don't think they should show that Paul had been Mentat trained as well. I believe that was also left out. So yeah, adaptations don't seem to really do a great job at delving into Mentats, which I think they're so fascinating, right? Because they are the human computer, because at this stage, the people have learned to not trust machines and computers, and so they have their computers be humans, you know? And I think that was just so unique and interesting, and I would have loved to see an adaptation really show more of the Mentats. And we do see more of them in Dune Part 1, but again, how it is even in Dune Part 2, and in general, the Mentats, I feel like, aren't given as much attention as they could have been. Which, speaking of technology, also in the books, you learn that if someone shoots a shield with a laser gun, it causes an explosion. <laughs> and so that is why, because shields are commonly used, that is why people don't use laser guns and they prefer knives and other weapons. It's because they don't want to risk them dying in an explosion. But then also, shields attract sandworms. So once you're further out where sandworms are, you don't want to use a shield. And so that's why maybe sometimes they use laser guns in those situations. But none of the adaptations really show this either, how using a laser gun against a shield causes an explosion. And I feel like that, knowing that explains why people are using knives, right? Which seems more primitive. So it's like, why are they using knives in hand-to-hand -hand combat in this advanced day and age? But it's because it can be dangerous. But then also with Howitt, so in the book, like I said, he thought Lady Jessica was the traitor and so did Gurney. And the TV show does keep Gurney believing Jessica is the traitor. And once he is reunited with Paul and Jessica in book and show, he tries to kill Jessica <laughs> and they have to convince him like, no, no, like it was Yui, not Jessica, like don't try to kill her. So the show does keep that. And then to talk about the Harkonnens, specifically Raban, because in the book, Raban is killed off page. It is not a climactic moment by any means. Whereas in the show, his death is very <laughs> dramatic. He gets attacked by a bunch of Fremen. They all like rush in on him and they start stabbing him. And then they cut off his head and one of the Fremen is like holding up his head. So a very dramatic moment. And also while they're stabbing him, it's shown in slow motion, which is 
has just aged so poorly and we get multiple fight scenes where it like slows down to slow motion and it's just so over dramatic and again just does not age well. And speaking of things that don't age well, the graphics and the use of green screen also doesn't look the best. Granted I wasn't expecting amazing CGI here because this is a made for TV show from 2000. <laughs> so I wasn't expecting anything crazy. But I will say that the David Lynch Dune from 84, that holds up better the graphics than the graphics do from this 2000 adaptation. And so yeah, there were times where it was distracting because it looked so bad and so amateur. I'm sure for the time, maybe it was more impressive or it looked less amateur, but 25 years later, uh, it was distracting how bad it looked at times. And also something else that bothered me are the Fremen eyes. For one, they glow, which was kind of weird, but you know, that's fine. My bigger complaint is that they weren't consistent because if someone was seen at an angle, their eyes looked totally normal. And it wasn't until you saw them more straight on that they had blue eyes. And then also in Children of Dune, the Fremen still have the whites of their eyes. Like their eyes are just like piercingly blue, but then the whites are still white. And Fremen eyes, like they have no white because the white is just another shade of blue. And so in general, I thought both Dune and Children of Dune did a really bad job at executing the blue Fremen eyes. And then also speaking of graphics, we see a, a guild navigator here and man, the guild navigators are so freaky looking in this show. And it's funny because we do see a guild navigator again in Children of Dune. However, in Children of Dune, the navigator looks entirely different, but it was a different person behind Dune than was behind Children of Dune. So I guess that explains some of the differences there. But yeah, they, it was so weird looking. I mean, the David Lynch navigator was also weird looking. so. They're all just so strange and I'm hoping we see a guild navigator in the future Dune Messiah so I will be very curious to see Denny Villeneuve's take on the guild navigators. And then as far as the acting goes like the guy who plays Paul I thought he was okay. <laughs> I definitely wasn't too impressed. And then William Hurt is the big name here. He gets top billing even though he is only in part one and then he dies because he plays Duke Leto. And he too despite being a big name actor, relatively big name, yeah he wasn't doing anything here that I was impressed by and there was no scene that really stood out to me and he was just kind of average. And in general the only actor that I was like the only actor that did make more of an impression was the guy who plays the Baron. I thought he was really good so he was probably my favorite actor from the show. But yeah, all in all, this is a faithful adaptation, like I said, and there are so many plot details that are the same from book to show. But this is an example of how, in my opinion, I don't think it always serves an adaptation to be incredibly faithful, detail for detail, you know? Like, I like adaptations where the director maintains the message and the themes and they stay true to who the characters are for the most part. But I don't need it to be exactly the same. I kind of want the director to put their own mark on the story, you know? and make it theirs in their own unique way. And also the fact that it's two different mediums, right? <laughs> and what works for a book doesn't always work for a movie. And what works for a book and makes it interesting, sometimes if you include all of that in a movie, it's just gonna be boring. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt about this show. I There were times when I felt pretty bored watching it, if I'm being totally honest. And also going against it, it also has the fact that I have seen the new Dune movies, which I think are amazing. And so I'm trying to go into it without any preconceived ideas ideas and not be comparing but at the same time after seeing you know the Dune movies that just blew me away and were just incredible to come from that to then seeing this it was just hard not to compare the two. I know I shouldn't because this again it's a made for TV miniseries from 2000 and it's not fair to compare it to this big bu budget blockbuster from 25 years later. But anyway yeah I just <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of this show if I'm being honest. Basically I can admire that they wanted to do some something so faithful and I like that they kept so much of the dialogue and yet at the same time I don't think being the most faithful doesn't equal being the best adaptation you know and that might be controversial because some people think that that is what an adaptation should be is as close to the book as possible but that's just not how I feel. Honestly I would rather watch the David Lynch Dune movie over this mini series because the David Lynch Dune it was very entertaining as bad as the pacing was and just <laughs> like it that also isn't the the greatest adaptation but I was more entertained watching David Lynch's Dune so that is the one I would be quicker 
longer to go back and watch, whereas this one, yeah, it's my least favorite of the three different adaptations. And I know a lot of people love this, so I don't mean to insult it or like talk crap about it or anything. It just isn't my favorite. But go ahead and comment down below <laughs> disagreeing with me. I'm more than fine with people just sharing their thoughts, whether you agree with me or not. You know, let's talk about it down below in the comments. And now it's time to move on to Children of Dune. So if you do not want Dune Messiah or Children of Dune spoiled, then this is where you should exit out of the video. But thank you so much for watching. Uh, so yeah, part one, again, this is like four and a half hours separated into three parts. Part one is an adaptation of Dune Messiah and the next two parts are an adaptation of Children of Dune. And yeah, the first part, Dune Messiah, I thought they did a good job staying true to that book. And honestly, I prefer Children of Dune, the book over the book Dune Messiah. So the Children of Dune parts is what I was really excited to see. But having said that, yeah, I thought they did a good job adapting uh, Dune Messiah. You know, we see Irulan kind of conspiring against Paul and preventing Chani from getting pregnant. However, Chani does end up getting pregnant due to the spice concoction she takes. And then we see Paul, right, as he is struggling after, you know, this has led to a 12 year holy war and so many deaths. And so Paul is just kind of struggling with what has happened in his name. And then by the end, you know, he goes blind, he goes into the desert, Chani dies, the twins are born and Duncan is brought back to life. However, he is played by a different actor here, but we have the same thing where at the end, the reason they brought, du brought Duncan back to life was so that when Chani dies, they can try to get Paul to get bring Chani back to life. However, he does not give in and Chani stays dead. So uh, yeah, all of these things are the same as what happens in Dune Messiah. And then Children of Dune, we have James McAvoy, of course, as the big name here as Leto, Paul's son. And then Susan Sarandon is also in this, which I had not expected. I read she was a big fan of the books and that's why she wanted to be in this, which I thought was really cool. But yeah, overall, I thought the casting was really good in Children of Dune. We have a new actress playing Lady Jessica and I like this actor better than the Dune actor who played Jessica. And then Aaliyah I thought was great. And we have the same guy who played is the bear in Harkonnen, he returns because his ghost kind of possesses Aaliyah. And I thought he was great as the Baron, so I was happy to see him return in the scenes with him and Aaliyah. All of that I just thought was really good. And then also the chemistry between Leto and Ganema I thought was really believable too. Like their bond is so important, right? Because they are the only two who understand each other. And so I felt like that really showed through in the movie and just like their connection with each other. Although I will say in the third episode there's a part where they're reunited and it kind of seemed like they had like some sexual chemistry going on and they kiss on the lips too and so that was just kind of weird but it's funny because in the book Leto well Leto and Ganema are only nine years old in the book so they aged them up for the movie which I think was a good call but yeah at the end of the book Leto says that he once he's old enough he is going to marry Gan Ganema in order to secure the throne so he's going to marry his own sister but it's implied that they won't have you know, they're not going to be having sex or anything because he's also sterile because he's combined with a sandworm. And so she will be having sex with that other guy, Faradin. But yeah, the mini series, we have that scene where they have like this sexual chemistry between the two of them. And yet they leave out the fact that they are going to marry each other. So I thought that was interesting. But again, this is a situation where a marriage is not about love, right? It's about politics. But then also, you know, speaking of Leto and Ganema, we also see Irulan here as well. So in Dune Messiah, we see Irulan conspiring against Paul and Chani, like I said. But as in the book, Irulan ends up raising the twins and she loves them as her own. You know, I like this with Irulan, how she loves Leto and Ganema and we definitely see that show through in the show. But I still feel like Irulan, uh, 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 for the book and the show, you know, the show had more for her to do in Dune, which I liked. But then in this, they don't really have her do much. But yeah, she just kind of is the same as she had been in the book. But then also because the twins are older at the end of this show, Ganema, she is getting ready to marry Faradin and there are they are preparing the wedding. Whereas again, in the book, she was only nine years old. So it's like planned that they would get married, but then they were never in the process. It was just like a betrothal because she was so young. And then even when she mentions the fact that Faradin will be her side guy while she's married to Leto, Faradin, you know, I don't he's older. And so the fact that this nine-year-old is talking to him this way he's like uh like okay like you're a child <laughs> and he's kind of creeped out by it and that is why Aaliyah they call her an abomination and then there's parts where they think where different people will call like Leto an abomination or something and an abomination is when you are possessed by someone essentially and because they are children acting like adults they think that they are possessed
possessed because that's the only way someone could be acting so adult-like, right? And so that's why Aaliyah is called an abomination because she was acting like an adult even when she was a child. And then there's a part where Lita was called an abomination, again, because he has these man-like mannerisms and yet he's only nine years old in the books, you know? But speaking of abomination, Aaliyah is now an adult here and she is ruling Arrakis until the twins are of age and she does become possessed by the Baron. And her storyline, you know, like she's so good in Dune, I loved her character. And then Dune Messiah, she's interesting to some extent, but yeah, like I feel conflicted on how Herbert chose to write her and where he took her character because I don't know, like Dune Messiah, I was a little disappointed in, but I, I feel like for the most part, I'm happy with how he wrote her. And then also like her demise because she ends up killing herself because she is possessed by the Baron. In the show, she stabs herself. In the book, she jumps out a window. But yeah, it's so tragic and sad that that is how things end for her in such a sad way. But again, I talked about this in the video with my brother. It kind of makes sense too, though, that she ended this way because she didn't have anyone else, you know, like Ganema and Leto have each other to rely on because they were also awoken in the womb. Whereas Aaliyah had no one. She had Paul, but even Paul just, I don't know, he was busy with his own stuff, right? And so she just had no one to really bond with and connect with and to help her through this life where she was awoken into consciousness and had all of these other memories that weren't her own. She had it so hard, you know? And so it makes sense that she kind of gave in to abomination and was possessed and then she died in the end, which is sad. And yeah, as in the book, we also have the people on Seleucus Secundus that are like conspiring to kill the twins and they think they do kill Leto with like the Lay's tiger. However, you know, he ends up being alive. But but yeah, we have Faradin who turns his mother in at the end in both book and movie. Uh, and then also we have Leto who combines himself with a sandworm larva in order to become part sandworm. And in the book, the sandworm, like the skin grows over him entirely. And people think it looks like he's wearing a still suit because it's just covering all his body. Whereas in the TV show, it's like these reptilian scales that are growing along his arm. And by the end of the movie, they still don't cover his whole body. They are like are all on his arm and his neck and back kind of. But I was kind of wanting to see it take over him entirely. And we just never got the chance to see that. But regardless, even though he's not entirely covered, he does get the power of the sandworm like he did in the book. And yeah, at the end of this, it was more ambiguous, I would say, with the ending. And he even gives gives Stilgar his, you know, the Atreides ducal ring. And he's like, this is a reminder that all leaders are still just humans and they make mistakes. And that basically you shouldn't put so much power and you shouldn't rely so much on a single person. And, you know, he learned from his dad, right? Because Paul hated what was being done in his name and he hated what he had become in the eyes of the people. Whereas in the book, we don't get this line. And in the book, Leto, he's like, I'm going to live for 4,000 years because I'm part sandworm. So I am going to be the emperor of the imperial for a long, long time. And also there's a part where I think she's talking to Faradin. Ganema is talking to someone, I think Faradin. And she says basically like, oh, there'll be a place for you amongst our leadership because we're gonna have people going against us and we'll need someone to keep them in line and kill the people who want to go against us essentially. So it definitely is being set up for like this, you know, tyrannical leadership where they will kill people who disagree with what Leto is doing, you know? And then in God Emperor of Dune, I have not yet read that, but I I did read that that takes place thousands of years later and Leto is going crazy because his brain is being taken over by a sandworm and he's becoming a sandworm and he also has just become this leader with way too much power and he's become evil I think is the gist I get. I'm so excited to read that book. I'm waiting for it to come in at the library but but yeah so basically the TV show has more of an, a positive ending than the book did whereas the book I definitely got the implication that this wasn't necessarily a good thing that happened. However you know, we hear that Leto, he had to do that. He had to fuse with a sandworm and he had to go down the path that Paul couldn't because that was the only way to like save the universe, I guess. But again, even though he has good intentions, uh, going back to that quote, the difference between the story of a hero and an antihero is where you end the story. And so Leto, maybe by the end of Children of Dune, he's a good guy. But as things go on, you know, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become a villain, essentially. But yeah, once I read God Emperor of Dune, 
soon. If I have a lot to say, I will make a follow-up video sharing my thoughts. If I don't have a lot to say, I will just write a Goodreads review and leave it at that. But it's supposed to come in within the next few weeks. So hopefully I will be reading that soon. But something else I wanted to talk about with Children of Dune is that in the book, because Arrakis, Paul, the Fremen, like they are the leaders of the galaxy. And so it's interesting, like the impact that has on other planets where other planets start wearing still suit knockoffs, even though they don't need the still suit for practical reasons. It's just that has become what's fashionable. <laughs> and then also the Fremen, you know, Arrakis does get turned into a paradise. And that's why Leto fuses with a sandworm as well is because, you know, sandworms are going to be like extinct or something. And that's part of what he has to do to keep them around and keep the spice. But yeah, Arrakis does become more of a paradise and it has its sand areas with the worms. But the Fremen themselves, like the Fremen people have become so lazy and spoiled and they're lazy with their still suits and don't really care about wearing them. And like we just see how they've gone soft <laughs> in some ways due to not living in such a volatile area. And we see how this affects Paul and other Fremen who are older and how they see this younger generation and kind of don't like the changes that they see happening with them. But yeah, the Children of Dune TV show didn't really delve into that. But yeah, I think that was all I had to say about them both of the miniseries. Um, I did like Children of Dune better than Dune. Although I will say Children of Dune had no competition, right? Like I wasn't comparing it to anything because Dune Messiah and Children of Dune has never been adapted. So again, I know <laughs> Dune 2000, maybe I should take it easy on it because of the fact that I have these other movies in my head and so it's just not fair to the TV show and I'm sure people in 2000 who watched this TV show it makes sense that people loved it because it was like the first faithful adaptation that had been made you know but yeah personally I don't think I will ever watch the 2000 Dune again although I do want to watch part one once it's available again but yeah Children of Dune though I was much more engaged the whole time and I found the story much more compelling and I liked the acting better as well I think just overall we had better actors here and yeah it was just cool to see this story brought to life. And James McAvoy, again, I thought he was great in the role of Leto. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. Share your thoughts down below in the comments. And I have done so many Dune videos at this point. I will link to every Dune video down below in the description. If I do not make a video for God Emperor of Dune, then this will be my last Dune video for a while <laughs> until the next Dune Messiah comes out, which is kind of sad. I don't know. Maybe I'll make more Dune videos just in some shape or form because it has been fun talking about this series. And yeah, I'm kind of sad to think that this might be my last one for a while. So thank you so much to everybody who has been watching my Dune videos. I hope you've enjoyed them. And I hope you stick around to watch the other content that I'm making that is not <laughs> Dune related. And yeah, thank you to all of the new subscribers I have received through my Dune videos. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Follow me on Goodreads. That way you can see when I do begin reading God Emperor of Dune. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you have not already. And I will see you next time. Bye.